like to welcome our second uh, speaker today, uh, Nina Power. Nina Power is a London-based uh, writer and philosopher. She also works as a translator and has co-translated two books from Alain Badiou together with Alberto Toscano. Nina Power's areas of research cover a wide range of fields and disciplines such as philosophy, film and art, feminism, feminism and social theory. She has published extensively in these fields. She regularly writes for The Wire, Radical Philosophy and The Guardian, among others. Her track to One Dimensional Woman gained international attention when it was published in 2009 with Zero Books and it was translated into many languages. The title might ring a bell to the Frankfurt, let's say, critical theory trained ears and reminds us of, uh, of course, um, Marcuse's Der Eindimensionale Mensch. Nina is currently completing a book on men in which she will provide a feminist but also man-sensitive analysis of the relation between men and women. Nina Power, we are delighted that you confirmed to participate in this symposium and uh, we are looking forward to your talk with the title We Live in a Society, Ironic Belonging and Meme Being in a Post-Public Age. Please help me welcome Nina Power. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thanks to, um, <laughs> I'll explain it in a minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you to uh, Anna and Susanna for inviting me and to MMK. Uh, and thank you also for standing by me and refusing to no platform me, um, despite the calls of several uh, people online um, and one participant. Um, and we can maybe discuss this uh, uh, tactic uh, if people would like. I'm going to address it indirectly in a certain sense and regarding the question of censorship and what can and can't be said by who um, and according to who. Um, but I want to begin uh, with a particular uh, story, a recent uh, uh, event that kind of happened or a series of events. Um, so on January the 7th of this year, under the headline, How to Fight the Far Right, Invite Them In, the German Museum Taking on Hate, writer Eliza Appley for The Guardian describes what she calls a case study in how arts organizations can win over a hostile public while remaining true to their ideals. Appley reports, and it would be interesting to compare the way uh, in which this story was reported in Germany, perhaps, compared to its reporting in the UK, about the Albertina Museum director, Hilke Wagner, in Dresden, where the city council last November formally declared a Nazi emergency. After multiple run-ins with Pegida and AFD regarding the public art supported by the gallery, as well as the programming within it, Wagner, who grew up in West Germany, um, had been uh, uh, criticized, uh, not a new debate, for her treatment of East German art in the museum, and re had received multiple uh, hate mails, emails, and phone calls to the gallery uh, from various people calling for her to lose her job, and so on, very offensive uh, messages. The article states that Wagner does not believe, quote, that all those who contacted her were far-right sympathizers, but that she recognizes, quote, the uneasy proximity between the assertion of local cultural heritage and the AFD agenda. Clearly, Wagner says, the AFD grabs this as a populist theme. They really try to deepen this divide between East and West Germany. Wagner's initial reaction to her attackers was one of distance and hiding. She was very afraid. She said she didn't want to leave the house for two weeks. But then she called, and in a, you know, one afternoon, one of the people who had written to her to attack her, wanting, as she put it, to clarify things. To her surprise, the conversation was, she says, beneficial for both parties. Wagner went on then to call every single person who had targeted her with emails and calls. All but one, the article, article reports, was a man. People were, the report continues, surprised that she had got in touch. Wagner is quoted of saying um, of Dresden that Pegida and the AFD voters are everywhere here. They're among families, colleagues, and our network of sponsors. Where are we if we simply say we're not talking to one another? Wagner then put on a series of dialogue events called We Need to Talk. Wir müssen reden, 
where up to 600 people, including the people who had been attacking her and criticizing her, people uh, you know, who had written terrible, horrible things online and to her personally, showed up to the event in Dresden. Wagner says, it was initially very difficult. We had shouting, door slamming, a lot of arguments and accusations, but it did develop in a positive direction. One of the issues that Wagner had to navigate was what Appley describes as the desire for, quote, civic victimhood on the part of those demanding that she exhibit more work from the East German era, as well as addressing the historical violence. So these were the demands of the people who'd been criticizing her. They wanted uh, more work, or the, the museum to show more work that addressed the historical violence conducted against Dresden specifically. So the 90% destruction of the city center in the Allied air raids of 1945, um, we can think of like Kurt Vonnegut's book who deals with this question but of the historical reality of the destruction of Dresden, the deaths of 25,000 people, the difficult years of unemployment and the departure of many young people from the city post reunification. And people were asking for art that reflects and deals with some of these major events and shifts, amongst whom who painted in Dresden at particular points, Kandinsky, Mondrian and Lisitsky. Wagner addressed these demands via a series of contextualizations in the museum, showing paintings de depicting Dresden's destruction alongside anti-war works by Maria Lasnig, Wolfgang Tillmans, and Marlena Dumas, amongst others, for example. The museum, therefore, for Wagner is, as she says, one of the few places where such direct encounters, both socially and artistically, can still happen. In relation to Wagner's attitude, we might also remember Karl Marx's assertion from the 1842 text on Prussian censorship that the truly radical cure for censorship would be its abolition. I begin my talk with this relatively recent situation because it provides a very complex and subtle example of some of the challenges faced by anyone interested in the question of what it means to perform society. I think Wagner embraces this question in the way she responds to this very difficult situation. The organizers of this event here in Frankfurt, Susanna Pfeffer and Anna Seller, state in their description of the event that, quote, societies are not given, but take shape in a pr process of negotiation, regulation, governance, and resistance. I don't disagree. What today does it mean to talk about society? With this word, we are in the first place confronted with a swirling vortex of opposing and antagonistic images and ideas, including those contesting the very idea that society exists at all, which I will return to shortly. The socius of the Latin root of the word implies companions and allies, and the later 16th century meaning of friendly companionship, the society, if you think about friendly societies and this idea of a smaller model, seems to be all but absent, we might say, of thinking about friendliness at the level of uh, larger groups. In the UK, for example, where I, where I lived, in the past few years, we have seen a society completely divided on major social and political questions, almost split down the middle, we could say, from Brexit uh, to the massive division between rich and poor. This is not just a political question of opinion and, and position. Um, but a, a deep economic uh, split is the most e unequal uh, country in, in Europe, um, well, surely to leave Europe, <laughs> I should say, not, no longer to be in Europe, um, on questions of the union and independence, question of Scottish independence, for example, um, the question of the definition of changes uh, to words and terms like sex, for example, in the Gender Recognition Act, um, and many other questions have really made a hugely divided um, society, even more so. Friendship, we might say, is in very short supply in Britain. How to describe this current social predicament? We are caught between the almost total quantification of existence, living in a very, you know, totally almost numerological society, a kind of capitalist number society, the daily alienated experience of life on the other, and then on maybe like a third robotic hand, we have the highly wired forms of collectivity that exist online and mediate, for better or worse, often worse, the other two. So this first image, uh, we live in a society. So this, this is the title for my um, talk. And this phrase is, is something maybe to be heard in something of an ironic or wry or kind of despairing uh, sense. Okay, so the origin of this meme, which is maybe from like two, three years ago, primarily, um, 
like, like most memes, whoever designed it, the origins are contested. Um, it's, it's a kind of authorless, uh, crazy anonymous uh, object or item image. Um, and here we can obviously see the, perhaps the point being made, you know, that on the one hand, this kind of superficial uh, <laughs> Mickey Mouse, the cartoon version of the mouse, garners far more likes and friends and, and hearts than the, than the real mouse, perhaps, even though both are not real, right, in a certain sense, but the kind of the more detailed, the more realistic uh, mouse. Um, does society today operate as a concept in anything other than this kind of dis dispassionate, ironic, wry admission of a certain kind of failure, a certain perhaps wistfulness for an idea of belonging that can only be found in inverted and virtual form online, uh, for example. The meme is a form of authorless, ironic inclusivity. Um, people are supposed to identify with everyone else who identifies with the meme, and in a sense, perhaps, to think of themselves as the kind of person who would like the real mouse rather than the, Mickey, the Disney mouse, you know, that one feels on the side of the loser mouse, perhaps, rather than the successful mouse. Um, a kind of comic invocation of a certain kind of shared suffering um, and a recognition, perhaps, that the meme uh, performs a certain kind of social role that humans used to enact for each other. Like, the meme becomes a stand-in for a sort of fellow feeling uh, in a certain way. Human beings are deeply mimetic, which is to say we mimic and we copy each other, and the meme is very in interesting in this. We're both mimetic and memetic uh, beings. We like, you know, the, the virality of the meme is also a reflection of our own uh, uh, sort of part uh, aping, part copying, part uh, rivalrous relation that we have uh, between ourselves. Because, why is this? Because we were actually quite similar on a certain level and we want the same or similar enough things. We might want, for example, recognition um, in, in certain kinds of ways. Um, but we also gain a collective sense of belonging from our inclusion, elective or otherwise, in this case, the despairing recognition that people, other people, will prefer the cartoon Mickey Mouse to the real mouse. But it works on several levels. It also implies that I am the kind of person who does not take appearances at face value if I share this meme. Um, but also that I feel my opinion is perhaps not countable or being expressed in the social sphere, if we can talk about the internet as a social sphere, which of course it is in a certain way. The original image from which the meme may or may not have been taken from, contestable, um, is from 2014, from a street artist called iHeart, um, entitled Nobody Likes Me, uh, where we see a, a small boy very distressed holding his phone, and uh, you know, presumably you know, the interpretation is that he's uh, upset that nobody has responded, no one is recognizing him. Uh, and he's uh, distressed by this. But it makes a broader point, of course, about the sort of vicissitudes of social media and, and you know, these kinds of uh, situations online, who is, uh, who is counted, who is valued, and so on. Um, we are reminded, or at least I am, by uh, Feuerbach, <laughs> in the essence of Christianity, um, from 1843, the preface to the second edition, uh, where he writes uh, the following. But certainly, for the present age, which prefers the sign to the thing signified, the copy to the original, fancy to reality, the appearance to the essence. This change, inasmuch as it does away with illusion, is an absolute annihilation, or at least a reckless profanation. For in these days, illusion only is sacred, truth profane. Nay, sacredness is held to be enhanced in proportion as truth decreases and illusion increases, so that the highest degree of illusion comes to be the highest degree of sacredness. And I think in these kind of uh, oppositions to the very idea of truth, um, we actually see uh, what Feuerbach is already talking about in diagnosing in the middle of the 19th century, which is to say a, a preference for a certain kind of illusion uh, and appearance. Um, we can flash forward a century to Guy Debord in 1967, who's very, very, uh, writes a very Feuerbachian uh, text. This text, uh, I would say, is, is like this, quotes Feuerbach at the beginning. In Society of the Spectacle, and Debord says this, the first stage of the economy's domination of social life brought about an evident degradation of being into having. Human fulfillment was no longer equated with what one was, but with what one possessed. The present stage in which social life has become completely occupied by the accumulated productions of the economy is bringing about a general shift from having to appearing. 
All having must now derive its immediate prestige and its ultimate purpose from appearances. At the same time, all individual reality has become social in the sense that it is shaped by social forces and is directly dependent on them. Individual reality is allowed to appear only insofar as it is not actually real. And obviously, Du Bois is writing this a long time before social media, but in a way he's per perfectly um, describing uh, the conditions under which we you know, participate to a greater or lesser degree, right, depending on our own uh, position. But as a general condition, you know, we could talk about this society of uh, appearances that in a certain way. Um, as the social uh, reality, as the dominant social reality, but it, which is at the same time a kind of opposed to any real individual reality. Um, and I think there's a sense in which a lot of people today don't feel that their lives possess uh, reality in a certain way. It's a very uh, interesting and difficult question that people, in a sense, accept the idea that we live in a matrix uh, to, <laughs> to some extent. So we have here then the shift from being to having to appearing. But older anthropological questions, and I would say psychoanalytic questions as well, do not go away, um, despite these sort of shifts in the uh, kind of attention economies or whatever we want to say. So belonging and ostracism um, remain. They're complicated and deeply human games, mired in violence and sacrifice. Um, the sacrifice, as René Girard will talk about, is a way of... Uh, hopefully preventing greater violence to stop the mimetic spiral. Violence, he talks about, is this incredibly powerful uh, force, which is uh, in basically impossible to, to eradicate, and he recognizes this. Uh, and the sacrificial structure that we find in religion and, and elsewhere um, is, in a sense, designed to prevent uh, greater uh, violence. But we must, in a sense, he says, recognize um, that this is that violence is a profoundly mimetic thing. Like if someone starts being violent to us, uh, our, our desire, our immediate response is to be violent uh, back uh, to them. And, and we had an interesting discussion on violence before, actually, in MMK. There's a good symposium a while ago on, on violence. It's very Christian. Um, and of course, we live in a world in which um, resentment is an everyday experience, right? So this is a clip from uh, Seinfeld, which is also perhaps one of the, the origins of the, of the We Live in a Society meme, uh, where George um, confronts a woman who's bumped into him or something like this, and with this, with this line, you know, we're living in a society, i.e., why aren't you behaving with more respect to me? You know, what is this kind of uh, daily, almost, encounter of, of, uh, with the other as a kind of obstacle? And Sartre talks about this in the Critic of Dialectical dialectical reason where he talks about seriality, the world of atomization in which we regard the other person as first and foremost, not as another human being possessed of dreams and fantasies and ideas and hopes, but as, a, as an obstacle, literally someone in my way, like the person in front of me in the queue, for example. And he says, this is, Sartre says, it's a daily experience of, of what it's like to live in an atomized uh, society and a kind of anti-collective, uh, anti-social society, if that makes uh, any sense. Um, and there are also kind of ideas here from the Joker, the recent film, of a kind of uh, a, a certain outsiderness, a deep kind of uh, non-belonging, an experience of not belonging, or ironic belonging, uh, a, a, a belonging that in a sense becomes itself an act of violence. Um, so René Girard, who I've uh, already mentioned, um, describes this kind of spiral, mimetic violence. How do we stop, basically, violent spirals, and I'm very interested in this. How do we stop spirals, let's say, of paranoia, of mobbing, of uh, groups uh, declaring their complete separation from other groups? I mean, historically, these are the motive forces, right, behind war. This is when things become truly, truly genocidal uh, and violent, where you have these kind of separation uh, of groups. So Girard says, as long as a working capital of accumulated hatred and suspicion exists at the center of the community, it will continue to increase no matter what men do. Each person prepares himself for the probable aggression of his neighbors and interprets his neighbor's preparation as confirmation of the latter's aggressiveness. In more general terms, the mimetic character of violence is so intense that once violence is installed in a community, it cannot burn itself out. Okay, so the question here would be, how do we prevent these mimetic spirals from uh, beginning, um, in a certain sense? Or recognize, perhaps in a more analytic, philosophical and psychoanalytic way, what the forces, what the emotions, what the power of uh, deeper currents that everyone possesses, that everyone partakes in, um, are in order to have an understanding of how we might uh, 
deal and confront with uh, confront these uh, these uh, potential forms of violence. In order to escape the suspicion at the heart of the community, it is necessary, Girard argues, to spawn new imitative forms of violence, right? So hence the sacrifice. The sacrifice comes in, or the scapegoat comes in to stand for the, the object or the group or the person that you actually feel that you really want to hate, okay? So in that sense, religion serves a very useful function, right? It prevents uh, the, the spiral. So you take your violence out on something or somebody else. Online, we could say, we are surrounded by imitative forms of violence. Whether they are new or creative is, a, is an interesting question. They certainly exist, either in the form of mobbing or complaining, perhaps, about somebody or something as a kind of lesser form, and think about the kind of uh, Orwellian idea of the daily hate, you know, could be directed at politician or something like this. You know, you write down your sort of annoyance at this person, maybe repeatedly, especially somebody in power. And even perhaps violent computer games could be seen in a Girardian way as creative ways of handling uh, the desire for violence by kind of displacing them onto a virtual uh, form. But what of community? And we should keep in mind here, I think, how much recent art in maybe the ten, last 10, 15, maybe 20 years has tackled the, precisely these questions of community and the public. Many, uh, particularly last 10 years, I would say, I've read a lot about public art and, and the idea of publicness um, in relation to, to art, not just public art as such, but groups in particular that uh, address the question of the public, like who is the public? Um, this question of public order, for example, um, which is a very state top-down idea uh, of preserving the police and so on, which you know, directly involves the police. Um, and what does it mean to be kind of an unruly pro public, a protesting public, a moving public, uh, and so on. So it's a big question, it's been a big question, continues to be uh, for many artists, I would say. And we could say that art and culture are precisely these places where difficult and conflicting ideas um, can, can and should be, I would say, explored and discussed, partly with a view um, to bringing to light these deeper emotions that can be played out within this sphere, rather than kind of escalating elsewhere. And, and I don't mean it to say that art and culture is simply and only functional places in a Girardian sense, right, for the prevention of greater violence. But in a sense, they, they are spheres and places. I mean, as Wagner, the Wagner case in Dresden, perhaps indicates where there can be a kind of discussion or confrontation with people who otherwise would be completely opposed on every social political issue. Um, so in that sense, I, I want to suggest that censorship and no platform, <laughs> platforming um, can be seen as attempts to ineffectively prevent these sorts of explorations, um, which might actually do more harm. Um, I, I don't think that censorship, either from the right or from the left, and we have seen an interesting shift, I would say, between the kind of right-wing censorship of a kind of Jesse Holmes kind of, uh, you know, we don't want uh, Maplethorpe, we don't want to fund Maplethorpe, uh, you know, uh, art that, f that deals with homosexuality or, you know, criticisms of degenerate art, which of course is a Nazi term, um, to thinking about uh, newer shifts uh, in, t in forms of censorship, which are not so much coming from the right, but coming from parts of the left. I, I think that these forms of no platforming and censorship don't work. I think they're absolutely counterproductive. I think they create more divisions. Um, and we might ask, who, is, uh, who can decide? Who is deciding who can speak or not? Um, and when we throw around terms like fascist and so on, um, there is a kind of question about you know, what we mean by this word. You know, what exactly is it that we're talking about? It's a very serious term to throw at somebody. Uh, and if you have no definition for the word, um, then you're merely enacting a kind of power, a gesture of power, a gesture of control um, to say that I am the one who can decide who, uh, that you speak or that you don't. In relation to the question of society, we could more broadly talk about perhaps a, a long Thatcherism, um, obviously coming from the UK context and now being yet again under Tory uh, rule. So as she infamously said, you all know, in 1987, in a woman's magazine, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women and families. Thatcher's point, she would later clarify, was that, quote, society was not an abstraction separate from the men and women who composed it but a living structure of individuals, families, neighbours, and voluntary associations. So she tried to kind of mitigate the, the very harsh and very kind of anti-socialist um, sounding nature of her initial statement. We might wonder, though, referencing Thatcher's later clarification, 
What is left today, even of men, women, individuals, families, and voluntary uh, associations? Um, I think, what does it mean to be any of those things and to feel that one is any of those things? I think there is a deep sense of fear and panic in the face of an absent or, a, a, or a, an apocalyptic future which has sprung up somewhere between a kind of economically enforced infantilism so that there for vast numbers of young people, the idea that one can even become a man or a woman or start a family um, has become a kind of question uh, infinitely deferred and this kind of uh, uh, infantilization, the inability to kind of become autonomous in any way. I feel like my generation was the last that just about was allowed to do this uh, and, and people beneath me uh, through no fault of their own are, are in a sense uh, kept held economically in a state of uh, more or less permanent infantilism, which is very, uh, a very difficult uh, position to be in. At the same time, we have a kind of libidinally wild algorithmic casualness at the level of social bonds in terms of you know, dating applications and so on, where the, the algorithm, in a sense, decides your social life for you, which we could argue eliminates questions of uh, encounter or risk or uh, randomness or chance, that there is a kind of dictatorial uh, algorithm uh, deciding who we should meet with and have sex with and so on. So what then can be the relation between fellow feeling, this idea of the social, and politics, how we live together in, in this age of algorithmic, infantilized consumerism? We could ask, what is the right mood for politics? How are we supposed to feel about things? We obviously live in a very anxious state. Think about the environment discussion around climate crisis and so on, a very anxious state, which is to say, one that pushes an idea of a very finite, an immediately finite future. And this is the kind of message that it's either too late or it's gonna be very too late very, very, very soon. And that kind of anxiety-inducing uh, you know, uh, position uh, does uh, produce a deep sense of kind of fear uh, and panic about one's own life, about the, the life of the species, about you know, many, many other questions, a relation to time in a particular way. What does politics have to do with emotion? Everything and nothing, I could say. On the one hand, there is this strong technocratic dimension to everyday life, the way in which things are measured, the most efficient way to manage people, the use of tools and technologies to carry out all the different things that people want and need and how they might be controlled by these sorts of uh, technologies, management, order, bureaucracy, the ordered treatment of those who do not behave, like the police state, and those who are unruly. We live under the symbol of the tool of techne, our connections are virtual and measure, measured before they are poetic and personal. This image is, of the world is the separation or irrelevance of politics from emotion, the technocratic image, the idea that they're not, they're not uh, part of the same thing. Emotion then stands in for everything that is not measurable, everything that is private and incomprehensible from a certain angle, unhelpful from the standpoint of the state. On the other hand, we could say, just thinking about it, politics is nothing other than emotion or the manipulation of it. We see this in the daily social media expression I already mentioned of people's anger and upset of, uh, with political decisions and election results at the outrage which greets Donald, uh, Donald Trump's tweets, who, you know, in a sense, single-handedly resurrected the fortunes of Twitter, which was on the decline before he kind of uh, started tweeting. Um, and his deliberate playing with the emotional register. I mean, Trump, in a, in a sense, is a very clever emotional manipulator, even down to the use of punctuation. I wrote a whole piece on his use of the exclamation mark. Um, it's, very, <laughs> it's very important. Politics seen this way uh, cannot be the separation of technocracy from libido because the two are inextricably intertwined. The control and manipulation of feeling is politics and technology is the means by which people, particularly people with power, do this. Every era has a technology peculiar to it or perhaps multiple technologies at once. We have a kind of car crash pileup of technologies. People still listen to the radio and watch television or Netflix, um, as well as log on to Twitter. There's a kind of, you know, overload in that sense. A mastery of these platforms, these different platforms, is simultaneously mastery of the narrative and of, of emotion. Um, I mentioned already the kind of, perhaps the anxiety about the future in certain, that's encouraged in certain political questions, particularly around climate, and I think the role of Thunberg as this kind of child actor um, is quite key in this, this kind of angry um, child as, and the, that emotional force there. But stories and facts are not separable from their emotional significance. In many ways, the battle of and for politics today regards the fusion of emotion and politics and their inseparability. 
um, between those perhaps who want to separate the two or point out the, the, the relation and those who want to center emotions either positively, so think of the second wave feminist slogan, the personal is political, but the other side of that was, uh, but the, also that the political is personal, um, as in organizing is also a question of who does what, let's say. Um, or negatively, uh, you could say a, a kind of a dismissive political position where you would say, well, most people are idiots and deserve to be controlled. You know, that I know better what's going on, right? It's kind of separation there. And this, I think, despite our common tendency to frame politics, is not straightforwardly uh, in this way a matter of left and right, but there raises this deeper question of understanding these tendencies at work, um, particularly con concerning those feelings of love and hate and their relation to politics, who loves and who hates and who is seen to be loving and who is seen to be hating. When the fact, uh, the phrase, facts don't care about your feelings, which is a famous, now famous uh, slogan, facts don't care about your feelings, was coined by conservative US writer Ben Shapiro, became very popular in the middle of last decade. The split or the battleground between this question of reality and emotion and politics and emotion becomes clear. You may not like the way the world is, or you may not think the world is fair, or you may want a different world, but the world is this way. You can cry about it all you want, but it won't change the order of things. This separation of facts and feelings is itself, though, simultaneously an emotional problem. One can, can respond by taking on a full-on pro-emotional anti-fact position and say, I don't care about the facts, this is how I feel. Or you could temper this position by saying, Look, I'm committed to other ideas and ideals that render these facts secondary or irrelevant to my politics. Against facts that, for example, point to inequality of different kinds, you could respond by saying, I believe that everyone is equal and that politics is the attempt to achieve equality to the greatest degree by ensuring, for example, that everyone has equal access to education, to care of all kinds, by protection from discrimination, and so on. You could also, and instead, contest the facts themselves and fight on that plane. Contest the method, contest the science, be against science altogether, for example, if you like. These, these positions, these different positions, play out in everything from flat earthers, so people deny that the, who deny the world is round, anti-vaxxers to climate change deniers, um, and so on, and many other positions. It is not clear that these kind of positions are immediately tetherable to the left or the right in any intuitive way, as there are apolitical people and people of all different political persuasions scattered across these beliefs uh, and attitudes. What we could call the pro-fact faction, so the idea that facts, you know, and, and this is perhaps in this example, in the Shapiro example, uh, a, a conservative position that's being associated with, so the idea that reality is just like this and you kind of have to toughen up and accept it. But we could also say that this pro-fact position, so-called, is also at times emotionally inconsistent, calling upon certain facts at certain times and ignoring and denying others, right? So it's not a purely uh, scientific position in that sense. It's the, it's the use of uh, scientific facts for po political ends. But there is a question here that cuts across the personal and the political, namely whether it is ever possible to put one's thoughts and desires and hopes in order or is social life doomed to be a sea of chaos, distraction and manipulation only by those who seek or by those who already have power? And what is the power of politics or the politics of power exactly? What is our role in upholding power unintentionally or otherwise? What is our investment in power? Are these desires incomprehensible? Are there desires incomprehensible to ourselves that nevertheless permit themselves behind our backs to be manipulated by others who understand better how these emotions work. It is a mistake to think or assume that there is, in this discussion concerning facts or feelings or between technocracy and the politics of emotion, on the one hand, something measurable, uh, rational, scientific, and on the other, something inchoate, incomprehensible, and mysterious. Indeed, a question. What if those in power precisely understood emotion as something comprehensible and proceeded along these lines and everybody else felt that there was nothing to be understood here? Would this not, in fact, be a, the greatest form of control to convince people that there is nothing to see here whilst all the time kind of manipulating people behind their backs? There are older and rational ways of thinking about emotion, so this opposition between reason and emotion uh, does not hold when we, when we look at particular thinkers. 
And it doesn't kind of elicit an immediate panic at the thought of thinking about emotion in relation to po politics. So Spinoza, for example, in The Ethics in 1664, makes it extremely clear that the emotions are as open to investigation as any other natural phenomenon. He says, the emotions of hatred, anger, envy, considered in themselves, follow from the same necessity and force of nature as all other particular things. So these emotions are assignable to definite causes through which they can be understood and have definite properties, equally deserving of our investigation as the properties of any other thing whose mere contemplation affords us pleasure. I shall consider human actions and appetites just as if it were an investigation into lines, planes, or bodies. This is Spinoza. So emotions, therefore, are no different in principle to geometrical objects or ideas. Here the key word is cause. And indeed, Spinoza proceeds to investigate the causes of everything from lust to avarice to ambition to love to hatred. If we can understand the cause of emotion, then we can understand the emotion itself and have a rational relationship to it, whilst not denying the reality of the, the force of it. We can endeavour, amongst other things, uh, ultimately to separate ourselves from the cause of negative emotions. So if we keep repeating a bad pattern of behaviour, let's say an addiction or something like this, we can, if we have an understanding that we are repeatedly putting ourselves in the, the same position, um, we can avoid uh, repeating these destructive patterns. More positively, the more we understand how God or nature, Deus Siva Natura, as Spinoza puts it, how it works, the greater knowledge we have, the more mapped, the more we have mapped what is, and we have a limited range of what we can and can't map, according to Spinoza. Thomas Hobbes, in Leviathan, in 1651, written during the English Civil War, attempts something similar with regards to the emotions by arguing, quote, that there is a natural condition of mankind that is open to comprehension and should not be left to superstitious accounts as he puts it. This natural condition presents, as for Girard and others, a curious kind of equality. Hobbes says, nature hath made men so equal in the faculties of body and mind as, though, uh, as that though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body or of quicker mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man and man is not so considerable as that one man can thereupon claim to himself any benefit to which another may not pretend as well as he. So actually, it's the similarity between us that causes rivalry and causes war, not the difference you could deduce from Hobbes's claim. So we are similar enough as to not only be understood, but it's this similarity that is at the root of, competi of competition, diffidence and glory, the three main causes of argument or quarrel, as Hobbes puts it. So his attempt is to try to understand these drives and desires and to imagine a way of preventing precisely excessive antagonism, pre preventing the time of war, the civil war that he's, he's in the middle of. How can we create a situation in which war is uh, recognised as, as a kind of ever omnipresent possibility um, between us? So politics or a common power is thus the comprehension of emotion in the attempt to generate peace, to allow for, amongst other things, industry, culture, knowledge, and history itself. For, for Hobbes, in war, there is no account of time, he says. So even the possibility of time is, is conditional on peace. What Hobbes and Spinoza share, above all, is the conviction that we can understand human nature, including our deepest drives. Um, how much longer shall I, do you think? One and a half minutes. One and a half minutes, okay. All right. <laughs> I had some, some things on Freud and love and, okay. Um, but let's just say, okay, so, so love, oh, okay, I can't really summarize Freud, it's quite difficult. I mean, let's just say for Freud, love is ambivalent. <laughs> That's my Freud in one sentence. Um, so love, even these very, very positive emotions, right, that, that we think are, you know, that we're on the side of love, we're good people, we're wonderful, we love everyone, humanity is wonderful, we're philanthropists, you know, not in the money sense, but we love everything and everyone, right? But love itself is ambivalent, right? Love, love itself is shot through with various other conflicting feelings, like the ones that Hobbes and Spinoza uh, identify. It can easily transform into hate, as we know, as when someone breaks off a relationship, you, you go from loving the person to hating them. 
Um, hate, Freud says, is a regression to an earlier sadistic stage. It retains its erotic character. Love is never free of desire, right? Love is never free of its erotic uh, character, he says. Okay, so I, basically, the erotic character of love and hate, extremely important to remember, because that's at the basis of politics and the manipulation of emotion in the current political climate, especially when people pretend that it isn't, and that makes people more manipulable. Um, okay, so politics and the social becomes a game of love, particularly, so like we could say that love, in a sense, uh, is deeper than hatred, or, or that hatred is a form of love, although Freud says that hate comes first because the child needs to push objects away in, immediately. Anyway, um, so just to conclude then, we can, we can return to the broken fellow feeling that I identified at the, be at the beginning uh, of this talk, of the social, right? So the kind of uh, disparities in recognition, uh, the kind of uh, feeling of, lacks of uh, lack of love, lack of sex, for example, in the discussion around incels, so the men who believe perhaps that they are entitled to a girlfriend um, and the kind of resentment that this might uh, induce in them. Uh, again, you know, very obviously a question of eros, of libido, of desire, of the unfairness of desire in that sense, and the idea that there might be a redistributive model of these things, uh, very serious kind of questions. Um, often our communal belonging is predicated on the idea that there is another who hates, that I myself do not hate, although we are clearly all capable of both loving and hating. Uh, this is a constitutive feature of everyone's uh, being in the world. Um, similarly, everyone is capable of uh, both uh, causing harm uh, and also being harmed. So there is nobody who is a pure victim in a certain sense and nobody who is a pure perpetrator either. We are both combinations of uh, the two, um, sometimes to greater or lesser degree. Um, so often then what happens when our communal belonging is predicated that there is an other who hates let's say the, the man in the AFD hates he purely hates he hates X and Y he hates immigrants he hates you know women uh, this idea that it's the other that hates makes it harder for us to easily more easily accept that we are capable of hatred ourselves um, it becomes a, a kind of uh, question of moralism, that we are like good people and that there are bad people. And this is a very, very bad basis for thinking about politics. It's a very unsubtle uh, and non-complicated way uh, that becomes almost like a quasi-religious uh, uh, position, um, that there is a kind of elect and others that must be hurt in the first place, You know that they must be hurt because they are bad. We've said they are bad, therefore uh, we are allowed to hurt them. Um, so the subject's supposed to hate. Um, we, we need to be kind of wary of this assignation, of placing this bad emotion, this negative emotion, always onto the other, and not also understanding that it is something that we ourselves feel to a greater or lesser degree, even on a, in an immediate angry daily basis, right? When we, we, for a second, let's say, hate the person who you know, pushed in front of us in the, in the queue or something like this. Um, so to say that people are hateful or stupid or deplorable does not help us and it's a very bad political strategy as Hillary Clinton uh, realized if you if you kind of dismiss most of the electorate as deplorable uh, funnily enough they're not going to vote for you um, because nobody likes that level of disrespect uh, it's kind of blatantly obvious if someone says we disagree on this topic and here is why but the other replies there is nothing to discuss I believe you are simply filled with hatred we cannot proceed Right? And I, this is what I'm saying is, is the problem. You know, when somebody says, I will not talk to you because I, pre I determined that you are a bad person and you are the kind of person for whom I, that conversation or dialogue or discussion is not available, um, this, is, uh, this is the, difficult, the difficulty. To moralize individuals or groups by claiming that one group is good and the other is bad, or that one group is good because the other is bad, is to give up too quickly on the possibility of not only winning the argument, it is to give up on truth, but of also and at the same time, it gives up on possessing a collective, deeper and more revealing understanding of the relationship between love, hatred, ambivalence, violence, and the social, in all things to which we are, for better or worse, participants. Thank you. Thank you.